um, there are indications the former president, Donald Trump, will be charged for a third time over his attempts to overturn the 2020 election. His lawyers are trying to figure out if there is evidence or witnesses they're unaware of that are bolstering special counsel Jack Smith's investigation. The potential charges, which are set out in a letter that was sent to the former president, suggest the special counsel will prosecute a much bigger case than Trump's team was expecting, which could mean more days in court during next year's election campaign. For now, it's not doing his chances much harm. Trump is 30 points ahead of Ron DeSantis, his nearest Republican challenger. But what would a second Trump term look like? Our next guest served in the first administration. Two years into that term, he blew the whistle from inside the Trump White House. Back then, he was known as Anonymous, but we know him as Miles Taylor, panellist on this programme and author of a new book. It's called Blowback, a warning to save democracy from the next Trump. Miles Taylor, good evening. Welcome to the programme. There is so much... Great to be book. with you, I spent, Christian. I spent my convalescence recovering from back surgery over six weeks reading it, and uh, I could go through all of it. But I want to really focus on the thing that I think has the biggest implications for all of us, and that would, was the, the row that was escalating within the White House in 2017 in relation to his standoff with Kim Jong-un. How concerned were people in the White House? Incredibly concerned, Christian. And, and let me be uh, hopefully the thousandth person to tell you we're, we're really glad you're back and, <laughs> uh, and that you're feeling better. Um, this is, th there's a lot of worry about what happened in the past. And, and, and let me say first, no one wants to read another Trump retrospective and another memoir from the Trump years. So I, I set out to write something very different, which is I got frustrated that there was not an authoritative account out there about what would happen if Donald Trump returns to the White House. And the likelihood of that is very high or of a MAGA copycat returning to the White House. And this incident that happened in 2017 is a great example of why. So in that period, uh, and, and this is reported for the first time in this book, the department that I was helping lead, the Department of Homeland Security, had to, for the first time in its existence, do nuclear planning for the possibility of a real life nuclear strike on the United States. Why? Because we grew so concerned about Donald Trump's bellicose rhetoric towards North Korea, most of which was unplanned and uncoordinated. We worried it would spiral the United States into an actual nuclear conflict. Now, make no mistake, the Department of Homeland Security often does exercises to prepare for nuclear war or dirty bombs from terrorists. But this was the first time, to my knowledge, we had ever had to practice a real life potential scenario because we were worried about the president putting his finger on that red button and starting a conflict that we wouldn't be able to de-escalate from. I have even graver worries about Trump returning to the White House or, again, a copycat being equally, if not more, reckless with the presidency uh, in a second term because there won't be those guardrails or those people there to tell him to stop. You talked about it on this program, and it's and it's been well written about the, the concerns that were there in the White House. But we should m make the point that back in 2018, we we knew there were problems, but it was you who blew the whistle from inside the administration in that New York Times column, which we reported uh, on the Hundred Days program. Um, you talked about a quiet resistance in the Trump administration. How far did that resistance go? And do, what, what do you think you stopped? Well, it was misunderstood a little bit at the time because what we were not was some sort of deep state internal coup. What I was referring to was public servants of conscience who were very worried about unethical, immoral, and sometimes illegal orders coming out of the White House and people who were willing to resist those orders and speak truth to power to make sure that bad things didn't happen, to make sure the levers of power in government were not weaponized for political purposes. Now, what we did not do was defy the lawful orders of a sitting commander in chief. The concern, though, of course, as you know, Christian, as the world knows, is that Donald Trump systematically identified people in the administration who were willing to tell him no, who were willing to warn him about illegal behavior, uh, and he fired them 
He pushed them out or he did such shocking things that led people like me to quit and determine that the only way to oppose him was from the outside. Now, I will say, Christian, I do have some regrets about doing that anonymously at the time. And I learned once I finally unmasked myself that the best way to turn against that was to attach my name to those criticisms because it made it for easier for others to follow suit. Yeah, uh, and but he roasted, in the cause. he roasted you, yeah. Miles. What, what did that mean for you and your family? For sure. Well, you know, folks don't need to have sympathy for me, but I am a cautionary tale of how dissent is now treated in the United States. Uh, and I've said this before, but turning against the president did cost me my home. It cost me my job. It cost me my family's personal security. It cost me close relationships. And I ended up on election night 2020 in a safe house alone in northern Virginia under armed guard with a pistol under my pillow because of the death threats. That is what dissent looks like today with this spike in political intimidation and violence in this country. And it's one of the things I really worry about. If there's a second term of a hyper populist president like Trump, I worry that they will use the levers of power to squash dissent. And, and that's why I, I wrote blowback. And I'm really hoping people heed the warning. Mm. You, you, you say that there were people inside the administration who were ready to put country before career. And yes, there was a cohort of grey men and women who would do that, but not everybody. I mean, and some serious people. There were there were secretaries of state. There was Jim Mattis. There was John Kelly. There was Rex Tillerson. I mean, these were serious people, uh, and they didn't come forward. Why not? It was a frustration of mine, uh, and I'd be lying if I said it wasn't probably the gravest disappointment of my career in Washington. But what I am encouraged by, Christian. Uh, is that there were people that came out. They may not have been household names, but you know, Jake Tapper at CNN on the eve of the 2020 election called us the largest group of ex-administration officials in American history to turn against a president who appointed them. But again, unfortunately, it wasn't the household names. It was mid-career professionals uh, who ended up standing up. I worry that next time there won't be there, there won't be those people rather to speak mm. out and. Uh, most of the people I interviewed for this book, most of them are Republicans and people Trump himself appointed. Their worry is that in a second administration, it will be staffed by what they call fifth raters or people without a conscience or enablers. It will be the political loyalists who are always willing to say yes and unwilling to resist unlawful orders. Uh, what really struck me about the book, um, largely because you had a female boss, um, uh, within Homeland uh, Security, Kirsten Nielsen, she was the Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, was how he treated women. And, and that's important context. When we think about the civil case in which uh, he was found liable and also the case he's facing in Manhattan, how, how did you view the way that he treated women generally within the administration? It was pretty horrific. I mean, it, it, was, it was grotesque in my view. And I actually struggled, Christian, with whether to even include anecdotes like this in blowback, because you could make an argument that that's about the man's personal character defects. But it's become abundantly clear to us that Trump's personal defects have imprinted themselves on a wider political movement. So it is very relevant to understand how this man operates because people are mimicking his behavior. And during the administration, he was misogynistic towards women. He talked about their looks and their appearance on television. He made sexual references to his own daughter. And that's one of those things I felt like it was important to talk about because even his hardcore supporters, I've got to think, will draw a line at incest. I mean, incestuous comments have got to be something that they are willing to turn against the man when they hear about. And it's important for them to understand mm -hmm. his character, especially if they're even considering re-interviewing him for the job of president of the United States. Mm. Um, obviously, uh, we started this segment talking about what he's now facing and perhaps a, a federal indictment in relation to 2020. But I mean, if you look at the polls, it's not doing him any damage. Um, and there's a very strong chance, isn't there, that, that he will be the Republican candidate. What effect do you hope this book will have, the people who read it, particularly there in the United States, who, who may be wavering on whether to vote for him or not? Well, there, there was a great piece of reporting out of The New York Times this week 
about how Trump would weaponize the presidency if he returns to office and that they've been developing a plan for that. That story was the tip of the iceberg. This book is the full playbook from the mouths of the people who were writing it about how they will go about weaponizing the levers of government. So what I hope it is, is a chance for people to peek into that future, be alarmed enough about it that they decide to turn against this guy in the presidential primary process. Even beyond that, I hope it's another wake-up call that we only have perhaps 14 or 15 months to reinforce democracy's guardrails in the United States to prepare for the possibility that someone like this could take office. I mean, make no mistake, the, the foreign policy of the United States will be a danger to all allied nations if someone like Donald Trump returns to office because he will revert to this posture of favoring autocrats and opposing our allies, which I think puts the, the wider West uh, and the Democratic alliance uh, in danger. So now's the moment for us to be able to reconsider and walk back from the brink. But um, it pains me to say, and it sounds hyperbolic, but I think democracy is on a knife's edge in the United States. And I say that as a national security professional, not as a political commentator. Miles Taylor, we salute your bravery those years ago in the administration and uh, congratulations on the book. It's a very good read. Thank you for coming on the programme. Christian, thank you and, and glad to see that you're feeling better. Thank you, my man.